Now in our 25th year, a quarter of a century of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are this week in amateur radio. Your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition, number 1303, with a release and air date of Saturday, September 14, 2024. Please take the program to your air, following the cue tone. On the amateur bands around the world, among the first podcasts on the internet, and on low-power FM broadcast across the U.S., we are this week in Amateur Radio, the worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,333 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL files with the FCC defending the 902 through 928 MHz band for amateurs. Ham Radio once again steps up to provide critical communications for Hurricane Francine. The FCC releases new rules and spectrum for the use of drone navigation. We will have the latest update from the League regarding information for volunteer examiners. Tucson Amateur Packet Radio calls for nominations for its board of directors. The Australian Communications and Media Authority issues new amateur licensing fees. The FCC adopts new asymmetrical sideband rules for FM high-definition broadcast radio. September is National Preparedness Month and we will have more advice on keeping your family safe. Teenage students in Canada gain their amateur license after completing amateur radio coursework. And, 252 kilohertz broadcasting from the Arctic Circle debuts soon. We will have the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anno Benchop, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will talk about all of the adult fans of amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Will Rogers, K5WLR, returns with another edition of A Century of Amateur Radio. This week, Will tells us about whether it was for public service or as a challenge worth attacking, Transmitting information across ever greater distances is what drove members of the Relay League to organize, in a segment he entitles The Relay's The Thing. And, we will stop by and visit with Bill Salliers, AJ8B in the DX Corner, with all the latest news on DX Peditions, DX, upcoming radio sport contests, and more. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio just outside Albany, New York, where we are having our second summer, this is W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Salem, Ohio, this is Denny Haight, NZ8D. And reporting this week from my ham shack in Cortlandville, New York, where you can tell autumn is on the way because I just had a glass of fresh-pressed apple cider. Mmm, it was good. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau in Knoxville, Tennessee, I'm Josh Marler, AA4WX. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where the trees are just beginning to show their fall colors, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our amateur radio outpost in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the song of the chainsaw is heard throughout our land, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where after enjoying a taste of autumn weather, we have returned to weather more reflective of late summer, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Denny Haight. NZAT. Leading off our news this week, the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, filed comments with the Federal Communications Commission urging that the 902 through 928 MHz amateur radio band be protected. ARRL joins hundreds of licensed radio amateurs who utilize the band in opposing a proposal from NextNav Incorporated, a licensee in the 900 MHz Location and Monitoring Service, or LMS to completely refigure the 902 through 928 MHz band and replace the LMS with high-powered 5G cellular and related location services. 
ARRL's comments filed by our Washington, D.C. Council on behalf of ARRL members and radio amateurs point out several problems with NextNav's request. Contrary to NextNav's assertions, the band is extremely crowded with millions of devices and transmitters in operation in multiple services, including the amateur service. Adoption of the proposal would result in either massive interference that would prevent proper operation or displacement to other bands. The difficulty is that there are no other bands known to be available, and in fact, some of the amateur operations in this band are here because they were displaced when a portion of the 420 through 450 MHz band, north of Line A, was closed to the amateur service some years ago. Others were displaced from the same band when the new federal government defense radars were initiated and continued amateur secondary operations would have interfered with their operation. Pushing amateur radio out of heavily used spectrum is a risk to public service, ARRL argues in the comments. When space can be found in this band, amateurs employ it to establish wide area voice and some television signal repeaters. Others are actively experimenting with digital mesh networks and associated control links. These networks are a testbed for digital design and experimentation, but are also available and used for backup emergency communications purposes. Still others operate low-power beacons for propagation research, weak signal work, tuning and experimenting to communicate over the longest paths with the least power, also is popular and leads to improvements in equipment. Mesh networks are becoming increasingly used in emergency communications. Just this past week, the ARRL Utah section announced that dozens of amateur radio emergency service volunteers are working to expand the mesh network around the state. The needs of participating agencies have evolved to require more than analog voice and low-speed data modes, said ARRL Utah Section Public Information Coordinator Scott Rosenbush, K7HSR. High-speed mesh networks use Arden Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network software, will allow amateur radio to play a larger role in supporting these agencies in emergencies. The ARRL Utah section already has a five-county mesh network in place. The proposal from NextNav makes it more difficult to operate networks like this one. Under NextNav's proposal, the much higher powered transmitters would be ubiquitous and operating 24-7. The resulting interference would effectively exclude many of the amateur radio operations that are operating in the 902 through 928 MHz band. The FCC docket remains open for reply comments from the public until September 20th, 2024. As of September 6th, Over 800 comments have been filed by amateurs and others who use this spectrum. Ham radio operators volunteering with the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service have successfully completed operations for Hurricane Francine, now a tropical depression. Here with more on amateur radio's response to the latest storm is John Ross, KD8 IDJ. We had a huge positive showing of Aries team members checking in and doing the thing. I sincerely appreciate everyone leaning into this activation, said Robert Hayes, KC5IMN, Section Emergency Coordinator of the ARRO Mississippi Section. The National Hurricane Center reported at 4 a.m. on Thursday morning, September 12th, 2024, that Hurricane Francine had made landfall early Wednesday evening in Louisiana, southwest of New Orleans, as a Category 2 hurricane before weakening to a Category 1 hurricane. It has now been downgraded to a tropical depression. Currently, the storm is moving inland over southeastern Louisiana with heavy rainfall spreading across Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. Early Thursday morning, the storm was 20 miles northwest of New Orleans with maximum winds of 50 miles per hour and moving northeast towards Mississippi at 14 miles per hour. At least 419,942 people were without power early Thursday morning. PowerOutage.us reported 392,440 people without power in Louisiana and 27,502 people in Mississippi without power. A turn towards the north, northeast, and north is expected a few days from now with some decrease in the forward speed. On the forecast track, the center of Francine is expected to move over central and northern portions of Mississippi through early Friday. The Hurricane WatchNet has secured operations but remains at the HWN Alert Level 2. That's the monitoring mode. During their 14-hour activation, Net Manager Bobby Graves said they collected and forwarded over 40 surface reports from southeastern Louisiana and the Mississippi Gulf Coast to the National Hurricane Center by way of WX4NHC. 
A copy of these reports is available upon request. Also, they had direct contact on many occasions with the Louisiana State EOC, WB5LHS, in Baton Rouge on 14.325 MHz. The VOIP Hurricane Net has also secured formal net operations. They did that on Wednesday night, 11:24 at 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. A total of 58 reports were submitted to W4HNC. Some of them were used in the NHC advisories and tropical cyclone updates. A complete listing of reports is at the VOIP website. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Reports range from wind damage to buildings, tree and wire damage reports, coastal storm surge flooding, wind measurement, rain gauge, and rain-related street flooding reports. ARRL will monitor the path of Francine and issue updates as warranted. Now celebrating our 25th year keeping the amateur radio community around the world informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at twiar.net. The Australian Communications and Media Authority has issued a new amateur radio license fee structure. The ACMA said in a news release that effective September 1st, we will introduce new fees for the following call sign activities. The new amateur radio fees are reassigning a special event call sign, $34, VK0 and VK9 call sign, $34, contest call sign, $15, transferring a call sign to another amateur operator, $15. The amateur radio call sign policy and website has been updated to reflect these new changes. Information about how we set fees is in the Fees for Service Cost Recovery Implementation Statement. Special event, contest, VK0 or VK9 call signs have a designated assignment period of 12 months. We will contact you before the expiry to remind you to apply to have the call sign reassigned to you. If a reassignment application is not made before the expiry date, the call sign will no longer be assigned to you and will be made available on the call sign register. Amateur operators with two-letter, three-letter, and F-series call signs should reconfirm ongoing use of their call sign every five years. There is no cost for amateur operators to reconfirm ongoing use of their two-letter, three-letter, or F-series call signs. We encourage amateur operators to log into ACMA Assist Link to reconfirm their call sign or apply to transfer or reassign call signs. Following feedback, we have made a minor change to the Amateur Radio Operating Procedures Link to clarify that communications established with another station is also referred to as a series of transmissions. The Federal Communications Commission issued new rules this week that would allow unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones, to use a portion of the 5 GHz spectrum band to enhance their wireless connectivity. The agency said its order establishes initial service rules that allow operators to obtain direct frequency assignments in a portion of the 5030 to 5091 MHz band for non-networked operations. The FCC first proposed rules in January 2023 to provide drones with enhanced spectrum access. The agency requested public input at the time on the types of safety measures needed to help unmanned aerial vehicles effectively share band access. The agency's order, released last week, said it is initially limiting drone access to the central part of the 5 GHz spectrum to address concerns regarding the impact of these aeronautical operations on adjacent services. The new regulations also established an interim access mechanism to allow drone operators to submit requests for spectrum access to the Federal Aviation Administration. Once approved by the FAA, operators would then be required to complete a registration form with the FCC. The interim mechanism will be made available to operators after the rules become effective, and the Commission has announced by public notice that it will begin accepting registrations, the agency said. The new rules noted that the actions are initial steps and that future actions may be needed to provide drone operators with enhanced wireless flexibility. FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel said in a statement 
that the agency will continue to work with public and private sector partners to support the best outcomes for public safety, wireless services, consumers, and our economy. We are already starting to live in the future we've long imagined. Uncrewed aircraft systems are fighting wildfires, supporting news gathering, delivering packages, and supporting national security, she said. The FCC is working hard to meet the spectrum needs of remote piloted aircraft activity. The Biden administration's National Spectrum Strategy, released in November 2023, noted that the FCC was moving to enhance drone access in the 5030 to 5091 MHz band as a starting point. Thereafter, this 61 MHz portion of spectrum will be studied so that the FCC can optimize unmanned aerial vehicle spectrum access across the band while avoiding harmful interference to other protected in-band and adjacent band operations, the strategy said. September is National Preparedness Month. In coordination with our partners at the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service is producing a series of weekly articles to help radio amateurs and their families stay safe. Here with this week's preparedness report is John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from ARRL headquarters. For a ham or any other public safety responder, whether paid or volunteer, it is not uncommon to be called out to provide assistance during disasters. We often do not know when we will be called or exactly when that call and what that call will involve. We also do not know how long we may be deployed. In the last edition, we focused on our Go Kit and the tools we should have to deploy as an amateur radio volunteer. But have we made sure our family is prepared for these times and whether we are deployed or will be staying home? As the theme of this month suggests, ARRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnson, KE5MHV, says it comes down to being prepared. Make a plan with your family and ensure basic supplies are available, including water, food, and first aid capabilities. Do you have a generator, alternate power capabilities, or do your family members know how to use it? Have a communications plan, including backup communications with family members and friends, he said. Johnston said that to ensure your family knows where to go if they must evacuate for some reason, always remember your family and your health and safety should always come first. Remember that there may be a time when you are the victim. There may be a time when you must turn down a request for assistance because you must take care of your family first. Ask if you can be put in a slot later down the roster to allow time to get your family to safety or have everything settled to ensure your family is cared for before deployment, said Johnston. ARRL recognizes the tremendous work ham radio volunteers put into serving their communities. If your mind is not on the mission, you may be putting yourself and others at risk. Therefore, you should ensure your family's well-being before, during, and after a major event, Johnson continued. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Learn more about how to keep your family safe at www.ready.gov. In many parts of the world, school is back in session and regular lessons have resumed. Even before regular classes began, however, 21 teenagers in British Columbia, Canada were already entrenched in some pretty important work. Adam, VE7ZAL, and John, VE7TI, believe that their recent course on radio frequencies and electronics may well be unprecedented for secondary school students in Canada. That was what John wrote in the September and October issue of The Communicator, the magazine of Surrey Amateur Radio Communications. John and Adam, a robotics teacher at Kwantlen Park Secondary School in Surrey, British Columbia, teamed up to help nearly two dozen 13 through 17-year-olds get a better grasp on the principles behind amateur radio and pass the gift of radio on to this next generation. By the time the course concluded, the students were able to sit the exam for the Canadian Amateur Radio Certificate. John wrote that Adam had proposed the idea for the course earlier in the year and that while the instruction progressed, the students' enthusiasm grew gradually with each session. He wrote, Throughout the course, we witnessed students experiencing significant revelations about the pervasive role of radio in our daily lives. Parks on the Air satellite communications, and high-altitude balloons were literally among the high points of the lessons. When the sessions ended, the tradition of a Thursday night get-on-the-air net kept the momentum going for the graduates. John and Adam hope to repeat the course next year.
United States scientists and the Space Weather Prediction Center of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration are collaborating with the National Weather Service to update the way solar storms and other space weather is classified. According to an article on Space.com website, the scientists recognize that new knowledge about geomagnetic storms and recent advances in technology require them to revisit ways they look at space weather and its impact on Earth and human space travel. The Space Weather Prediction Center's program coordinator, Bill Murtaugh, explained the need for the change during an interview with Space.com, saying the user base and needs have changed. The capabilities, the science, and our understanding of the science, a lot has changed. And the scales, for all practical purposes, have not changed, and they need to. Some current scale categories for geomagnetic storms reflect impact on power grids and spacecraft operations, for instance. And others focus on radio blackouts that have a serious impact on HF radio and navigation systems. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. It is time once again for this month's Volunteer Monitoring Report. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between the ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. Here is this month's activity report of the Volunteer Monitoring Program. Two licensees in Michigan and Wisconsin received advisory notices to stay off local repeaters, both having received stay-off directives from the repeater owners. The licensees were informed that further use of the repeaters would be considered deliberate interference and would be referred to the FCC for enforcement action. Technician class licensees in Pennsylvania and Michigan received advisory notices for FT8 operation on 40 meters. Technicians have only CW privileges on 40 meters. A good operator commendation was issued to a licensee in Virginia for exemplary operation as net control of a daily net meeting on 7.251 MHz. A volunteer monitor alert was issued on July 20 for a pulsing noise on 20 meters. The VM program administrator participated in a nationwide online presentation to ARRL section managers and participated in one FCC meeting. The totals for monitoring were 1,908 hours on HF frequencies and 2,801 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 4,709 hours. We thank volunteer monitor program administrator, Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH for this report. The FCC has adopted new rules with a report and order to allow FM broadcasters transmitting in digital format to use asymmetric sidebands without needing experimental authorization. This move is aimed at giving FM stations more flexibility in their digital operations, enhancing digital coverage while minimizing interference to adjacent analog channels. Historically, FM digital broadcasting has required symmetrical sidebands, meaning that the power levels on both the upper and lower digital sidebands were identical. A symmetric sideband operation, now permitted, allows stations to adjust power levels independently on each sideband. This flexibility will allow stations to increase digital power in one direction to maximize coverage, while decreasing power in the other direction to protect adjacent analog stations from interference. The new rules will streamline the notification process for FM stations adopting this technology. This change is expected to lead to increased adoption of digital broadcasting among FM stations and enhance the reach and quality of digital radio. The rulemaking followed petitions from the National Association of Broadcasters, Xperi Corporation, and National Public Radio, who have long advocated for increased flexibility in FM digital broadcasting. The FCC acknowledged their studies, which demonstrated that many stations could operate at higher digital power levels on one sideband while protecting neighboring analog signals by reducing power on the other sideband. The FCC also noted that such operations have not led to significant interference in tests. The FCC's decision affects nearly all FM stations except for those operating on channel 300, 107.9 MHz, 
which still require experimental authorization for asymmetric sideband use due to concerns about interference with the aeronautical radio navigation spectrum. In addition to asymmetric sideband operation, the order introduces a new table that FM broadcasters can use to calculate maximum permissible digital power for each sideband. This step ensures that FM broadcasters can optimize their digital signal coverage while adhering to interference protection requirements. The new rules reflect the FCC's ongoing commitment to promoting digital radio adoption while balancing the need to protect traditional analog services. Commenters on the issue expressed support for the rule change, highlighting its potential to improve the quality and reach of digital radio signals. The changes to the rules will take effect 30 days after publication in the Federal Register, though stations may begin notifying the FCC of asymmetric operations immediately. ARRL previously reported that we are responding to a serious incident involving access to our network and headquarters-based systems. Several services have been affected, including those administered by the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator. Exam Registrations and Materials ARRL Volunteer Examiners should continue to submit exam registrations and material requests. We are able to post new or revised exam session dates and details to the website, and we continue to ship out exam materials. Please remember that most exam materials are available on the League website. Processing Applications to the FCC We are processing amateur radio license applications to the FCC. This includes applications for new and upgrade licenses, individual applications, and club license applications. The VEC exam session upload webpage was not affected by the incident. The VE session counts webpage data entry programming has been unavailable since May 12th. This will be updated with the new data as soon as we are able. VE accreditations, international radio permits, and license class certificates. We are unable to create volunteer examiner badges, certificates, and stickers. New ARRL VE applications and renewals are unable to be processed at this time. International amateur radio permits and license class certificates are being created and shipped. 2024 through 2028 extra class exam booklets. A previous version of the story indicated that the ARRL VEC will supply its officially appointed field stocked VE team leaders with the new extra class exam booklet designs around mid June. Due to ARRL's recent system disruption, the shipment was delayed. The exam booklets were shipped out July 8th and should have been delivered before August 1st. VE teams may contact the ARRL VEC to receive instructions on how to print new extra exams in the interim. The newly revised pool must be used for extra class license exams starting July 1st, 2024. Exam designs based off the previous pool are no longer valid. The outdated versions of the extra exams should be destroyed or thrown away to avoid a mix-up at the testing session. ARRL Youth Licensing Grant Program and FCC Application Fee Reimbursement Information ARRL is continuing to accept reimbursement forms to cover the one-time $35 application fee for new licensed candidates younger than 18 years of age for tests administered under the auspices of the ARRL VEC. Reimbursement checks may take longer than normal to be processed at this time. We appreciate your patience as ARRL continues to work on restoring access to affected systems and services. A new frontier in radio broadcasting called zone casting is on the horizon. More than a few U.S. stations are using the technique. Zone casting allows FM broadcasters to tailor programming and advertisements to different parts of their market using FM booster stations operating on the same channel as their primary signal. Theoretically, a station could simultaneously broadcast distinct commercials to varying neighborhoods or even buildings within its primary service area. Some broadcasters have raised concerns about potential interference and increased FM noise from multiple signals on the same channel. Despite assurances from proponents, skeptics argue that such a system could exacerbate existing challenges in maintaining signal quality. Currently, three minutes per hour is the maximum allowed per broadcaster in the U.S. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, 
available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. Coming up, This Week in Amateur Radio is presenting another chapter of A Century of Amateur Radio, Hams, Organizations, Events, Inventions, from the mind of Chris Cordella, W2PA, and his editing team. Each episode will bring a different aspect of early amateur radio history. Coming up here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Hello and welcome to the DX Corner for your weekly dose of DX. I'm Bill. AJB. Often people will ask me if there is a written copy of the information that I present here. There are so many call signs, dates, and URLs being discussed, you could never remember them until such time as you could write them down. I use most of the same data that you hear in the DX Corner for the weekly DX column in the Ohio Section Journal. If you just Google ARRL Ohio Section, you will find the Ohio Section website and you can subscribe to the weekly journal and get most of this information. The actual website is arrl-ohio.org. This is a free journal and you don't need to be an ARRL member to receive it. You won't get the well-rounded information that you get from the This Week in Amateur Radio podcast, but you will get the DX information that I list here. So here's what's happening in the world of DX. This section of DX News comes from Bernie, W3UR, editor of the Daily DX, the Weekly DX, and the House DX column in QST. If you would like a free two-week trial of the Daily DX, your only source of real-time DX information, just drop me a note at thedxmentor at gmail.com. The September 2nd through 16th KH8 Tango Expedition to American Samoa appears to be going well. The team has been QRV on 160 through 6 meter CW sideband and FT8, FT4. They have provided daily updates. The most recent one reads, quote, Operated single sideband on 10 and 15 yesterday, more today. CW and FT8 still going strong. Two or three stations on the air at most times. Over 8,300 QSOs in the log so far. Rain has prevented much antenna work on the 5th. We have received several comments about our FT8 time being off. We are running Mindberg, syncing to the Oceana time server pool on all computers. We're also checking with time.is several times daily. This site always reports our time to be, quote, exact. We are still looking into this, however. Club Log live stream is still working well. Updates to M0URX and LOTW occur daily. We appreciate the support and the donations that, that are coming in. So there was a follow-up immediately after that. Quote, We know that we are getting a lot of requests for more sideband CW and less FT8 time. There are only three of us here. Still, a lot of antenna work is going on, and that takes at least two people. So rather than take two stations offline, we decided to have the one person staying inside run all three radios on FT8. When on FT8, there is simply no end to the number of station calling. With regards to low bands, we have the low band antenna up. Right now, it is configured for 80. There is a lot of local noise on all bands, especially the low bands. We plan to run a station on 80 FT8 at over at our sunset and our sunrise, which yesterday was 518 Zulu and 1721 Zulu. Next week, we may reconfigure the vertical for 160 and or 60. So here's the final update that I have. After a few days, we have over 17,000 QSOs in the log. We are continuing with all modes. We are still dealing with local noise, and we think it is coming from power lines and street lights. This makes it difficult to dig out weaker stations. The low band vertical was completed yesterday and configured for 80 meters. We had one station on 80 FT8 all night and made 400 QSOs. Our plan is to configure for 60 and 160 later in the week. We encountered N1MM issues after we hit 13,000 QSOs in the log. When typing in a call sign, it would not appear for a few seconds. This delay made it very difficult when logging CW or sideband QSOs. 
The solution was to save existing logs and create a new log as you went forward. Livestream, as well as M0URX and LOTW uploads are continuing to work well. For many stations, I'm sorry, for any station who believe that they were logged in incorrectly, the process is, if possible, work us again before September 16th. We do not mind dupes. Or wait until after September 16th, then use the log check request button on the M0URX website. Our logs are uploaded in real time and our operators do not have the ability to edit them. Um, honestly, if you're not sure you're in the log and you can't prove it, I'd work them again. If you wait till afterwards and you do the log check request and you don't come back as being in the log, then they've already left the island, so you're out of luck. The team greatly appreciates and has continued to be encouraged by the support and the donations that are coming in. Mark your calendars for January 2025 for a multi-call Marquesas de-expedition. The F6 KJS Club is planning a de-expedition to Marquesas January 12th to the 27th, 2025. Doesn't that seem like a long way off and it's four months? TX7N will be on Hiva, uh, which is our island OC-027. They plan to operate with four distinct call signs, 160 through 6 meters in satellite, CW, sideband, and digital modes with five stations. Satellite will be on 70 centimeters and an EME station will be on 23 centimeters. Both of those will use the call sign TX7MAS. In the RAF Cup event, they will use the call sign TX100RAF. And in the CQ Worldwide 160 meter contest CW, they will use TX7WW. Dates have been announced for Charlie 8 Kilo, the Mozambique D Expedition. Planning is underway for a de-expedition to Mozambique January 18th to February 1st, 2025 with the call sign C8 Kilo. This will be an all-band, all-mode operation on 160 through 6, including 60 meters, Joe, W-A-G-E-X, CW, Sideband Ridi, FT8, FT4, and PSK. They will also be on the Q0100 RS44 and IO-117 satellites. If local internet is available, they plan to use Club Log live stream. I'm excited about that one. Mustafa TA2 IMG has been in the Ivory Coast since 2016. He has recently been issued the call sign TU5 ML. Mustafa has an ICOM IC7300, double bazooka antennas, and a 40 meter delta loop. Listen for him on 160 through 6 meter sideband and FT8, as well as the Q0100 satellite. F6 ICX Eric will be back in Madagascar from October until the end of this year. His radio activities uh, as 5 Radio 8 IC will be during his quote free time periods. He will mainly be on 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 CW. Due to the local QRN, he will not be on 160 or 80. He runs 100 watts to a dipole on 40 meter, half wave antenna on 30 through 15, and a two element. HB9CV on 10 meters. The best times to listen for him are during the morning period's gray line for USA and at the end of the day on the high bands. There are a group of German ops heading to the kingdom of Eswanti. They will be using the call sign 3 Delta Alpha 0 Delta Lima from October 25th to November 9th. Plans are to have five stations and be active on 160 through 10 meters on CW sideband and the digital modes. Equipment will include three IC7300s, two IC705s, along with the amplifiers. They will have verticals for 160 and 80 meters, loops for 60, 40, and 30, a spider beam for 20 through 10, a spider beam for 30 to 12, loops for 20, 15, and 10, and an HB9 CV for 17 and 12, and a beverage. Boy, they are really going to be outfitted and ready to go. Next month, ZL4TE Pete is heading to Samoa where he will be QRV operating holiday style as 5 Whiskey Zero Tango Echo. He's taking an IC705 and will be running 10 watts into an EFHW, which is an NFED half wave, for activity from October 3rd to the 10th. Pete will be mostly on CW with some FT8 and sideband for the POTA and WWFF gang. Listen for him on 40, 20, and 10 meters. His QSOs will be uploaded to Club Log and LOTW. Starting later this month, KH0-KC0W Tom 
plans to be QRV on AO91, ISS, SO50, SO121, and PO101 in the Marianas Islands. He believes that those from Japan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Northern Australia, Guam, Korea, Taiwan, and the far eastern China, Shanghai, will have the best chances of a successful QSO. So good luck to you all on that. So here's one I need is Bangladesh. S21DX is scheduled for December 13th through the 19th, and it's a de-expedition to Dal Char, Bangladesh. There will be a, quote, lot of youth operators who have joined the team. Organizers hope they will get more interested in DXing through this experience in the coming days as they do some prep sessions, including making a K9AY antenna and other antennas. YL Raka, the XYL of S21RC, has her own call sign now, which is S21YLJ, and she has also joined the operation. And I can't wait. Good luck to you guys. I may have to take that time off just so I can get them in the log. T88 Delta Tango and T88 Radio Charlie, operated by JH1OLB and JH1FFW, will be November 14th through the 20th from the Palau Radio Club. Mark, ZL1DO, will be on holiday in the South Cook Islands today through September 17th with the E51DOO call sign. He has a Yezu 710 with him and a, quote, assortment of wire portable antennas. Mark is not sure how often he'll get on the air with family activities planned, but he'll do his best. KH2 stroke JH3 DJX will be operating from the Reef Hotel in Guam September 29 to October 1st. He will have a Yezu FT757GX, 100 watts to a fishing rod antenna with a tuner, 40 through 10 meter CW and FT8. You can QSL through the bureau to his home call sign of Japan Hotel 3 DJX. If you are someone who likes podcasts and or YouTube episodes, the DX Mentor has a discussion with Dave, AA6YQ, about his groundbreaking and free, I might add, station control suite of software products, otherwise known as DX Lab. And the most recent conversation with Dave really highlights what's difference uh, between DX Lab and all other uh, packages that are out there. Check it out on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. And again, it's the DX Mentor. So now let's talk about contest updates real quick. I know that the ARRL contest sheet is read elsewhere in this podcast, and the contests that I mention are sometimes redundant. However, there are a few contests that I have found to be especially useful for DXers who are trying to fill band slots or to get entities or zones in the log that may otherwise be difficult to get. The contest that I'm gearing up for and actually practicing for is the CQ Worldwide RIDI DX contest at the end of this month. I have had great experiences in this contest over the years and have made some great friends and picked up some good DX in the process. I checked the CQ Worldwide RIDI website to see how many folks have been active in the contest. I assumed that it was really dropping off. I was very surprised to see that participation had gone up last year by over 5%. There were 3,357 logs submitted in the 2023 contest. Of course, this is only the logs that were submitted. For instance, I can only spend about three hours in the contest last year and I did not submit a log. I should have to help validate some of the QSOs, but time just got away from me and it was too late. If you currently are using FT8, you already have everything you need to participate in this contest, even if it's only for a small amount of time. The two applications that I've used for RIDI are TrueTTY and MMTTY. Since I do use the DX Lab suite of products for my shack functions, MTTY is built in, so I've settled on using that, and it works just fine. As many hands will be dusting off the RIDI software and testing it before the contest, there should be an uptick in activity over the next couple of weeks. Give it a try and let me know how you do. Until next week, this is Bill, AJ8B, saying seven threes. And thanks to my ex well Karen, for her love and support. I hope to see you in the pileups. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Welcome to the 12th segment of Ham Radio History, a century of amateur radio. Ham's Organizations, Events, Inventions. 
I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. I want to thank Chris Cadella, W2PA, for allowing us to use his excellent website in the preparation of these programs. So, presented here is the next of many chapters of Ham Radio History. The Relay's The Thing. Whether for public service or as a challenge worth attacking, transmitting information across ever greater distances is what drove members of the Relay League to organize. The thrill of wireless communication was reinforced with each additional mile covered, even as signals became weaker. Relaying was an obvious way to extend range beyond the capability of one pair of stations in direct contact, and it required more than just knowing who was located where. Urged by the first district radio inspector, the league directors produced a blueprint for relaying messages. Fittingly, it was published as the league article of the inaugural issue of QST and consisted of five actions hams should take. First, to make two-way contacts a little less random, hams should maintain regular hours for listening and make their presence known by transmitting a simple QST with their location and QRU indicating readiness to receive messages. Second, everyone should purchase a copy of the list of stations for 50 cents, which contained information about each station. Besides the usual information about the operator and location, the book also contained his transmitting power, what kind of a spark gap he has, how far he can send, the number of words per minute he can receive, his usual listening in time, what kind of license he holds from the government, and whether or not he has a telephone near at hand for delivering or receiving local messages. Additions to the list were regularly published as addenda in QST. One particularly interesting name and callsign combination appeared in the January 1916 listing. Frank M. Ham of Cornwall-on-Hudson, New York, with the callsign 2CW. Third, Ham should get an official league license. Issued only to league members, it could be had for just 50 cents. They did not really explain why it was essential to effective message relaying, but did state that it was similar to the one the U.S. government issued and that you ought to order it at once so as to have it framed and hanging up in your operating room when the time comes that you want your station to look well. As a package for only one dollar, you could get the list of stations, the official league license, and a pad of message forms. What a deal! But wait, there's more. An ad on page 24 in the same issue offered the same package for only 50 cents if one responded by 6 December. Fourth on the blueprint list was to join the league, which was free. One only needed to fill in an application form and attest to having a working station capable of receiving a message, no mention of transmitting. Once again, applicants were asked to obtain the list of stations and the license certificate. After name and address, the next most important piece of information on the two-page application form was the length and height of your aerial and the number of wires it had. Then came a section on sending equipment characteristics in which it asked, what tone has your spark? With a single blank next to the question, it was well understood that this referred to the dominant tone of your signal, normally determined by the frequency with which sparks were made. You were then asked to name the five most distant stations you had communicated with and their distances. On the second page of the form was a space for listing your receiving equipment, with six lines devoted to a free-form description followed by various other questions about your station and your own personal capabilities. Finally, just before the signature, the form asked you to affirm that I hereby offer to relay or deliver any amateur radio messages that are sent to me. The fifth and final item in the blueprint was to obtain a special license from the government so you could operate on 425 meters. These were available to operators who held a first-grade commercial license and who were also recommended by the League. 
you could get a recommendation if you were located sufficiently far from the seacoast so as to not interfere with commercial and naval stations and could successfully argue why you needed to use 425 meters to relay messages. Typical reasons had to do with the longer wavelength being capable of greater distances than on 200 meters and having a need for the increased range because of the remoteness of your station. You would apply to the league, which would recommend you to the district radio inspector, who then would send it to Washington, where the Bureau of Navigation would take action. The ARRL had already established a close relationship with the government, which considered League credible enough to provide this vetting process for special licenses implied in the 1912 law, but not prescribed in detail. The blueprint was meant to increase reliability and celerity, celerity meaning swiftness or speed of the relay process. QST pointedly referred to amateur stations as relay stations to emphasize their special nature and participation in organized activity. The items of equipment in such stations were called instruments. Included in this material are quotes from the following. Reliability and Celerity, December Radio Relay Bulletin, QST, December 1915, page 5. With appreciation to W2PA Chris Cadella for the use of his website's materials, Ham Radio History, A Century of Amateur Radio, Ham's Organizations, Events, Inventions, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Los Angeles County's Transportation Agency joined hundreds of amateur radio operators in asking the Federal Communications Commission to deny a proposal to reconfigure the lower 900 megahertz band. The L.A. County Metropolitan Transportation Authority is worried that in-car transponders used for its tow lanes would see interference. The agency wrote to the FCC on August 30. The toll program processes 110 million transactions annually and has more than 850,000 active transponders. If all existing licensed and unlicensed users of the lower 900 megahertz frequencies are compressed into a significantly reduced portion of the spectrum, Metro will face potentially significant difficulties in identifying frequencies that can be used for its transponders without being subject to interference moving forward wrote Mark Linsenmeyer, the head of the county's toll lane program. He argued that interference would contribute to missed transponder reads, degraded customer experiences, and lost toll revenue. Currently, the 902 to 928 MHz band is occupied primarily by federal radio location systems and some medical and scientific devices. Secondary to those are licensees providing location and monitoring services, and below LMS are amateur radio users. Unlicensed wireless devices get last priority. An LMS community called Navstar, a geolocation company and one of the main LMS licensee holders, asked the FCC in April to alter its rules for the band to allow the company to operate a nationwide GPS supplement. NextNav's proposal would see the company swapping its current holdings in the band for a single nationwide license for 15 MHz most of the band, 902 to 907 MHz for uplink, and 918 to 928 for the downlink to support its geolocation network and 5G broadband. It would also involve higher power levels for NextNav and moving other users to the 907 to 918 block of the band. Hundreds of amateur radio operators have also written to the agency to oppose a rulemaking. They say the plan would make their devices and networks more prone to interference. NextNav wrote its petition that the GPS doesn't work well indoors or in urban canyons, and GPS signals are subject to jamming, spoofing, and other targeting events, and that its nationwide terrestrial network was the only viable option for bolstering GPS. Comments in the proceedings are due September 5th, and reply comments are due by September 20. Proud to be among the very first podcasts on the Internet, you are listening to the weekly Amateur Radio News and Bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio.
It's time for this week's satellite shorts from all over. And this week we begin with the ASU announcing the upcoming FTX-1FHF 6, 144, and 440 portable transceiver, presumably a replacement for the FT-816-817 series. The transceiver is said to have two independent SDR receivers that provide simultaneous dual-band operation, whether in the same or in different bands. This does not necessarily mean the transceiver will operate in full duplex mode. It will provide 6 watts of power output with the included 5,600 milliamp lithium-ion battery pack, or up to 10 watts with external power. Average CW sideband operating time in the VHF-UHF bands is quoted as up to 8 hours. Sideband CW, AM, FM, and C4FM operation is available. USB ports support CAI operation, audio input and output, and TX control. The FTX-1F has not been formally released for sale in the U.S., but should be available early in 2025. Next up are details from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, officially ending its mission of SLIM, the country's first moon lander last week. Originally only expected to operate for a single lunar day, and then feared to be doomed after it landed in the incorrect orientation after losing an engine bell, the mission managed to survive three lunar nights and compete all pre-mission success criteria. SLIM, SLIM, is the first lunar lander to successfully perform a pinpoint landing, arriving within 10 meters of its selected landing site. And our final satellite short this week, the average age of a GPS satellite is now 13 years, with half of them exceeding their designed lifespan. The USA-132 satellite broke the record for the oldest GPS satellite in history, having completed 27-plus years in operation. While the record is an indicator of the reliability and robust engineering of the GPS satellite, it also means the service still relies on hardware built in the 1990s, 31 GPS satellites are in operation today, down from 36 in 2016. The GPS system was primarily designed for military purposes, but was opened up to wide-scale civilian use in 1983. Since then, GPS has grown into one of the most widely used services in the world, with billions of people using GPS on a daily basis. The overall GPS network still works well, but with the aging of satellites coupled with the delays in the launch schedule, threatens its competitive edge as international rivals bring into service their own GNSS system and private companies develop alternatives. Foundations of Amateur Radio To get into the hobby of amateur radio is easy, but that doesn't mean it's simple. I was introduced to the hobby three times. The first time I was a sea scout in the Netherlands. It was Jota, the annual jamboree on the air, and radio amateurs across the planet were set up at various scouting locations with their stations, showing off how to make contact with faraway places. My memory of it is brief. I recall a green heavy army tent with radios on a table. There was noise everywhere. I was told that I was hearing a station in Brazil which seemed incongruous, given that I was standing on an island surrounded by other sea scouts, a place where I had been camping and sailing for several years. We trooped out of the tent, and ten minutes later I broke a finger, playing a game where you sat on a mast trying to upend the other person using a canvas bag with a jib in it. I was unceremoniously upended and landed poorly, and broke the middle finger on my right hand, Being a teenager, that was of course a source of immediate ridicule and innuendo, and getting a dink, that's Aussie slang for getting a ride on the back of the pushback of my boatswain to the local hospital, after rowing from the island to the mainland, caused me to completely forget that amateur radio experience. The second time I came across the hobby was through my then manager, Ian, whom I now know as Victor Kilo 6 Kilo India Hotel, but at the time he was a quiet-spoken man thrust into the role of manager. The introduction came in the form of a Daihatsu charade with a massive, what I suspect was a 40-metre HF whip. The amateur radio aspect made little or no impression. The antenna, clearly much too large for such a tiny vehicle, did. I don't recall ever talking about amateur radio or even seeing his setup. Come to think of it, I'm not sure if I ever have. 
The third time I came across the hobby was at a dinner table surrounded by my fellow dog cow geeks. One of them, Meg, then with the call sign Victor Kilo 6 Lima Uniform X-Ray, showed us her brand new shiny purchase, a drone that could be controlled remotely via Wi-Fi on 2.4 gigahertz. She went on to tell us that the range was pretty limited because it was Wi-Fi, but because she was a radio amateur, she was going to experiment with an amplifier. This was permitted because, as I learnt, the 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi frequencies are shared with amateur radio. You might know it as the 13 centimeter band. I asked about this thing called amateur radio. I wanted to know what was involved. How would you become one? What would it cost? You know, all the things everyone always asks. I was told that there'd be a course in two weeks with an exam the weekend after. I asked if we needed a group booking and was told to just rock up. So I did. I got my license in 2010 and my world changed forever. I will add, just to make sure that if you're planning to do this, that during my course I discovered that my license wouldn't permit my use of the 13 centimeter band, so I'd have to upgrade. I promptly purchased the requisite course material and started reading. In the meantime, I got distracted by the activities at a local club. Then I bought a radio. Then I was told I wasn't a real amateur because I only had a beginner's license. So, to prove a point, I started having fun with my license. I haven't stopped since. Now, some, or maybe all of this, I've shared before. Here's something new. I'm a so-called AFOL, or adult fan of Lego. It's not a guilty pleasure, I'm happy to admit it. I have too much Lego around me. My oldest set is from 1964, House with Garage, number 324-2. It's not complete any longer. The car is long gone, the garage door weights are broken off, but it has pride of place in my living room. History does not reveal how I came into possession of it. Best I can reconstruct is that in the deep dark corners of Australia, it takes a little while for kits to arrive, since I was born after the kit came into existence. I do know that I had it before 1976. The other day I was watching a documentary about Lego, and one thing stood out to me. I'll share the entire quote by Keld Kirk Christiansen, the then president and CEO of the Lego Group. Quote, During the 1990s, we kept thinking that much more should be done for the adult hobbyist builders, as we called them at the time. Most people on the management team thought we should concentrate on children instead, but I felt that a person could have an inner child at any age. End quote. Why this is important is because of my activities as a radio amateur. We as a community keep saying that we should grow, that we're losing too many people, that we need to engage with STEM or science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Whilst that may be true, and whilst Jota and Scouting might give us exposure to fresh new people, there's a massive community of adults who already know about our hobby. They just don't yet know how it might interact with them, personally, or how they might find it interesting, or engaging, rewarding, and all the other things that you, as an amateur, already know about. So, if there's adult fans of LEGO, why not adult fans of amateur radio? Whilst thinking about that, how would you talk to them? How would you go about finding them, relating their interest to our hobby, finding common ground, and discovering even more things that we can add to the thousands of amateur activities we already know about? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available to download as a podcast from anywhere on the web podcasts are available. Bruce Page, KK5DO, is here now with this week's AMSAT report. Bruce? Thanks, John. The FunCube data warehouse shut down on August 31st after a move to a virtual machine. The warehouse came back online September 3rd and is processing packets as usual. Dave, G4DPZ, says FunCube 1 is now 11 years old and is operating in low-power telemetry mode 
with the transponder in order to manage the battery capacity. AMSAT deals Erminaz mission has been postponed until 2025. Rocket factory Augsburg conducted a hot fire test of the first stage rockets. Nine engines were ignited and an anomaly caused a loss of the first stage. Fortunately, as this was only a test of the engines, there were no satellites involved. Thanks to AMSAT DL for this information. JAXA, Japan's National Air and Space Agency, has officially ended the SLIM mission. It was supposed to last only one lunar day. However, after landing in the wrong orientation, losing an engine bell, it still managed to survive for three lunar days. SLIM completed all pre-mission criteria. Another feather in their cap is that SLIM was the first lunar lander to successfully perform a pinpoint landing. It was within 10 meters of its selected landing site. Thanks to Orbital Index for this information. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Back to you, John. And thanks, Bruce, for that report. It is time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report. Brought to us each week by our solar prognosticator Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington. With sunspot numbers up and solar flux decreasing, we saw 10 new sunspot groups this week, 2 on September 6th, 3 on September 7th, 2 on September 8th, 1 on September 9th, and 2 on September 11th. Average daily sunspot numbers increased from 155.3 to 178.4, while average daily solar flux declined from 230.3 to 223.7. Geomagnetic indicators were quiet, with the average daily planetary A index dropping from 14 to 7.9, and middle latitude numbers from 12.7 to 11.7. The solar flux forecast for the near term calls for the 10.7 cm numbers to be at 200 on September 12th through the 14th, 195 on September 15th through the 18th, 215, 225, 225 and 220 on September 19th through the 22nd then 225 on September 23rd and 24th. The predicted planetary A index for the near term will be 25, 35, 25, 15, 12, 10 and 8 on September 12th through the 18th, and 5 on September 19th through the 25th. In Radio Sport this week, more great contest on September 11th, the RSGB 80-meter autumn series, that's CW. September 14th and 15th, the WAEDX contest, single sideband and phone there. September 14th, the Africa F T4DX contest, ST4. September 14th through the 16th, the ARRL VHF contest, CW phone and digital. September 15th, the North American Sprint, RIDI, that's digital as well. And on September 15th, the Bardic Sprint, PSK 63 contest with PSK. And remember, you can visit the ARRL contest calendar for more events and information. Upcoming Section State and Division Convention, September 20th through the 22nd, it's the Duke City Ham Fest, sponsoring the ARRL New Mexico State Convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico. September 21st and 22nd, the Midwest Superfest, sponsoring the ARRL Illinois Section Convention, that's in Chillicothe, Illinois. September 28th, the Red River Radio Amateurs Hand Fest, sponsoring the ARRL Dakota Division Convention. That's in West Fargo, North Dakota. And on October 5th, the Wichita Area Ham Fest, sponsoring the ARRL Kansas State Convention. That's in Wichita, Kansas. And don't forget you can search the ARRL Ham Fest and Convention Database to find events in your area. Three director positions on the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Board of Directors are now open for nomination, and nominations may now be submitted. TAPR board members serve three-year terms, and their responsibilities include attendance at both in-person board meetings each year. One is held at Hamvention in May, the other at the Digital Communications Conference in September. Regular participation in continuous board session, which is conducted over the internet. Active engagement in TAPR's management. To place a person in nomination, please remember that he or she must be a member of TAPR. Also, confirm that the individual is willing to have his or her name placed in nomination. By September 21st, 2024, send that person's name or your own if you wish to nominate yourself, call sign, mailing address, email address, phone number, and biographical sketch 
250 words maximum via contact at tapr.org or via snail mail to tapr 1 Glen Avenue, Walcott, Connecticut 06716. An online election will be held October 6, 2024 to October 19, 2024. The ARRL September VHF contest will be held September 14th through the 16th from 1800 UTC on Saturday through 0259 UTC on Monday. All amateur frequencies above 50 megahertz may be used. The second weekend of the ARRL 10 gigahertz and up contest will be held the weekend of September 21st to the 23rd from 0900 UTC Saturday through 0759 UTC Monday. And any amateur band from 10 gigahertz through the light might be used. The VHF Fall Sprints, a series of single-band mini-contests sponsored by the Mount Airy VHF Club, will be held Tuesday, September 7th for 222 MHz, on Wednesday, September 25th for 432 MHz, and on Saturday, October 5th, 902 MHz and above. And for more information, you can visit ARRL.org slash September dash VHF. Remember, U.S. amateurs of all licensed classes may participate in these events. And with the change in the seasons, condition may be ripe for enhanced propagation on the VHF and UHF bands. ARRL contest program manager Paul Bork, N1SFE, said cool nights and warm days create some unexpected propagation, especially near waterways and coastal areas. Tropospheric ducting is a primary form of propagation in the late summer and early fall. We may also see a little sporadic E, meteor scatter, or even aurora if we are lucky, said Bork. With good conditions, stations hundreds of miles away can be worked on 6 meters and up. Keep your eye on VHF propagation tools for when you might be able to expect enhanced propagation in your area. And do you need an antenna for 6 meters? Well, then consider the ARRL Mamu Beam antenna. It features a 10-meter Moxon, 28 megahertz, and a 6-meter Yagi, 50 megahertz. You can learn more at www.arrl.org slash beam. The Battleship Iowa Amateur Radio Association, Biara, will activate NI-6BB in memory of Operation Chromite, the Battle of Inchon in the Korean War, on September 15, 2024, from 0800 to 1600 Pacific Daylight Time, 1500 to 2300 UTC. Modes and frequencies will be shown on the Biara front page. Bands and modes activated will be dependent on propagation and Biara associate participation. QSL per instructions found on the Biara website as well. During the Korean War, 1,789,000 United States military personnel served in the Korean theater of operations, resulting in 137,250 casualties with 36,940 killed in action. There were 3,737 soldiers missing in action as well. The activation of NI-6BB will be to honor American veterans and their United Nations allies who served during the Korean War. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. A new and faster way to communicate during emergencies is being planned by the Utah section of the ARRL Aries Group, which serves Salt Lake County, the most populous area in Utah. Here to tell us all about it is John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARRL Utah section public coordinator Scott Rosenbush, K7HSR, said that discussion and planning for mesh networks using Arden Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network Technology is on the drawing board. A recent meeting and presentation by Brett Pruitt, K7BDP, Utah section emergency coordinator, was attended by a large group of ARIES amateur radio operators. More than a dozen Salt Lake County hams have already invested in Arden technology with an interest in helping to create and support an emergency mesh network in that county. So the Utah Aries groups have already created a five-county mesh network that can be used for emergency communications. We hope to ultimately connect to Starlink and run the mesh network over that, said Pruitt. Our November 2nd, we will have an exercise with hospitals in the northern and southern Utah Aries groups using the regular Internet. 
After that, if Starlink is more readily available, we will run the drill again without the Internet to fully test the new technology. Barrett said the goal is to have everything working by early 2025. The needs of participating agencies have evolved to require more than analog voice and low-speed data modes, said Rosenbush. High-speed mesh networks using Arden software will allow amateur radio to play a larger part in supporting these agencies in emergencies. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The Utah section is working to extend this technology, said Rosenbush. Our hope is to bring this technology to other parts of the state to increase the communications capability and value of amateur radio to partner agencies. The next Cincinnati Hamfest is still almost a year away, but organizers are wasting no time in finding a deserving group of amateurs to receive the award for Great Lakes Region Club of the Year. To be eligible, a club must be located within the Great Lakes region of Kentucky, Ohio, or Michigan. Most importantly, clubs that are nominated must demonstrate a passion for amateur radio and be active in its advancement. Cincinnati Hamfest also presents an award for Club of the Year among nominees located within the Ohio Valley region of Indiana, Kentucky, or Ohio. Nomination forms for both awards are available at the Hamfest website, Cincinnati Hamfest, that's one word, dot org. Cincinnati Hamfest won't be happening until August 9th, 2025, but the months ahead will go quickly, so consider who you might want to nominate for these honors. Tracking and downloading images from NOAA, Polar, and Russian meteor weather satellites are an excellent way to introduce young persons to the world of amateur satellites and radio communications. True, they are not amateur radio satellites, but they are loud and always on. Viewing an SDR dongle costing less than $50, a laptop computer that every kid already owns, and free software, youth can get their first taste of tracking a satellite across the sky using a smartphone app, recording a downlink, and printing out pictures of their own weather in real time. From there, it is a simple jump to listening to voice communications and printing APRS packet conversations from the ISS, another easy-to-hear and predictable source of signals from space. Historically, WX2IMG has been the software of choice for the popular hobby of decoding NOAA-apt weather satellite images with RTL, SDR, and other SDRs. However, the software has unfortunately been abandoned by its authors for several years and can now only be found on third-party websites, which increases the possibility of downloading a virus. Jacobo Cassini's IU1QPT, author of SatDump, and Robin Slovacek, OK4AWO, are now sharing their thoughts about switching to SatDump which now has full-feature parity with WX2IMG and additional features, too. SatDump is available on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and even on Android. Just search for SatDump. Also available to watch on the RTL-SDR website is a short video on setting up a simple V-dipole for NOAA weather satellite reception with the SDR dongle. If you need to get more ideas on weather satellite picture reception, just go to YouTube and search NOAA Weather Satellite Reception and be prepared to watch several hours worth of useful videos. Copying NOAA weather satellites is easy to do and a fun way to introduce youngsters to space communications. It could be the first step to getting that technician license. The Reading Radio Club in eastern Pennsylvania plans to make some history of its own with a special centennial event involving an iconic name recognized by railroad buffs around the world. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with the details. The RCC will honor the 100th anniversary of the historic Reading Railroad with two special event stations on Saturday, September 21st, 2024. Club call signs W3BN and W3CCH will be on the air in two separate operations 25 miles apart. The day-long celebrations will see club members use W3CCH on HF stations set up inside two retired passenger railroad cars parked outside the Reading Railroad Heritage Museum in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. 
A separate group of club members and friends will use W3BN on two HF stations of longtime contester Steve Dobbs, NE3F, who's now a silent key, in Spring Township, Berks County, Pennsylvania. Dobbs was involved in the planning for the celebration using his station, an array of towers, beams, and wire antennas. He passed away August 30th, 2024, and it was his family's wishes that the event still proceed from N3F's QTH. Activity on all four HF radios will be on 10, 15, 20, 40, and 80 meters with frequent spots on the DX clusters. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The Reading Railroad earned its place in history starting in the 1830s as the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. Its network of tracks and trains was established to carry anthracite coal from the mines in northeastern Pennsylvania to the port in Philadelphia. More information about the celebration can be found at either W3BN or W3CCH on QRZ.com. In Melbourne, a 1939 building that once housed a telephone exchange and a 2003 a telecommunications museum is reopening this month as the National Communications Museum at Hawthorne. The big day is September 21st. When the doors open, visitors will get a vast range of the past and present technologies used in communications throughout Australia. The building had formerly been home to the Victorian Telecommunications Museum, which was run entirely by volunteers from the Australian Historic Telephone Society until the museum's closure in 2019. According to its website, the new museum has inherited some of the collection from its predecessor. Emily Seedens, co-CEO and artistic director, writes on the website that the genesis of the building's design and planning occurred during COVID lockdown with the purpose of exploring human relationships with technology. She went on to say that ethical exploration of the development of new technologies has never been more urgent, especially given the rapid pace at which they are developing. The 42nd Annual MSAT Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting will be held on Friday through Saturday, October 25th and 26th, 2024, at the Doubletree by Hilton Tampa Rocky Point Waterfront in Tampa, Florida. Highlights of all scheduled events include AMSAT Board of Directors meeting to be held on October 24th and 25th, the 42nd AMSAT Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting on October 25th and 26th, Friday Night Social and Auction on October 25th, AMSAT Banquet and Reception on October 26th, and AMSAT Ambassador Breakfast, to which all are welcome, will be held on October 27th. The complete schedule and registration information can be found at launch.amsat.org. AMSAT is excited to be able to host its 42nd annual symposium this year. They hope that you can join us in celebrating amateur radio in space. Meanwhile, AMSAT reminds its members of its first call for papers for the symposium. Proposals for symposium papers and presentations are invited on any topic of interest to the amateur satellite community. We request a tentative title of your presentation as soon as possible, with final copy submitted by October 18th for inclusion in the symposium proceedings. Abstracts and papers should be sent to Dan Schultz, N8FGV, at N8FGV at USA.net. Serving the amateur radio community for a quarter century, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Heard around the world on the amateur bands and streaming on the internet. On Monday evening, August 19th, 2024, just a few weeks before the planned launch date of the Hermines payload, Rocket Factory Augsburg conducted a hot fire test of the first rocket stage at its launch site in Saxford Spaceport on the Shetland Islands, during which all nine engines were ignited. Unfortunately, this resulted in a serious anomaly that led to the complete loss of the first rocket stage. The repair work, fault analysis, qualification, and delivery of a new first rocket stage will take some time. So Rocket Factory Augsburg now officially expects a launch in 2025. The Armina's mission is a joint effort between AMSAT-DL 
AMSAT EA, and the Libra Space Foundation, with each organization flying its own satellites and jointly using the PicoBus deployer developed by Libra Space in the Hermines mission. Examples of the payloads include Uni-1 and Maria G 1.5P pocket cubes from AMSAT EA in Spain. They are both based on the Hades D hardware, currently in orbit, and provide a repeater service for voice and data communications in FM and FSK modes. They were developed and built by AMSAT EA in collaboration with private sector companies and with the participation of universities and educational centers. Both satellites will provide licensed radio amateurs around the world with the ability to conduct FM and FSK QSOs, including FT modes such as FT4 and FT8 or AX25 APRS. The satellites will also transmit telemetry with their status, voice messages, and CW. Both satellites have the amateur radio special call sign AM1HAD. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And to wrap us up this week, radio listeners tuning to 252 kilohertz may soon be enjoying some long-range DXing as Arctic 252, the new broadcast station on that frequency, begins testing things out in September. The Finnish base station is hoping to serve listeners throughout the Arctic region. It is possible, too, that anyone with a long-wave radio receiver might be able to hear some of its signals in the northernmost parts of North America. According to Hackaday, the website reporting this story, the same frequency is used by an Algerian station in North Africa, and it was formerly used by an Irish station, as well as Finland's own YLE long-wave broadcaster, although both have long since gone off the air. The broadcaster says on its website, arcticradio.net, that it hopes for a clear channel allocation by the International Telecommunications Union. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on-air and podcast, Please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeater systems all around the U.S. and around the world on great operations like WA0RCR from the center of the U.S., Wentzville, Missouri, where This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to be part of the legendary Gateway 160-meter net report each weekend. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, 
Parks on the Air and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.